and welcome to the Deadhead Cannabis Show. Jim Marty here from Longmont, Colorado. Beautiful fall day here. I'm out in the barn. I got my partner, Larry Mishkin, in Chicago. How you doing, Larry? I'm doing just fine, Jim. Thank you. It is actually a beautiful day here as well. Unfortunately, I don't have a barn. Uh, so I'm sitting in my kitchen uh, looking out at sunshine and a, uh, a lovely day. That's a beautiful uh, time of year. Some people like... Uh, this, this stretch from now till Christmas is their favorite time of year. I agree. Anyway, we got some things to talk about. Start out musically. It's been a lot of Cream and Eric Clapton on the radio because of Ginger Baker passing away. Yeah. I had not been following him personally, you know, to know uh, what his particular situation was, but the news really kind of caught me off guard. You know, it made me start thinking that, unfortunately we may be starting to hear a lot more of that kind of stuff with guys from that generation just because he was 80 years old i was lucky enough to see ginger baker just a few years ago and he's still playing really well uh he sat in with ringo they had uh, two drum sets set up for ringo's all-star band they played drums together for some of the songs and then for other of the songs ringo would come out front and sing like yellow submarine ginger baker would be solo on drums but yeah, we gave him a big round of applause when Ringo introduced him when he came out and sat down in the drum kit next to Ringo's. So I do have a fond memory of Ginger Baker. That was probably 10 years ago, I guess, so not too long ago. Cream and Blind Faith, both for me, were fans that kind of helped me connect into the jam band scene and really kind of expanded my musical repertoire a little bit in terms of all the different sounds that they did. And it seems like no matter... You know, which of these groups was out there somehow ginger baker was always right in the middle of it and i kind of loved all the articles that they've been writing about him he was a very eclectic guy he raised polo ponies and was yeah, an avid yeah. polo player which yes. just cracked me up that was his thing i guess there's a and, documentary about him I forget the exact name of it something about mr baker yeah that, 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 that shows his old side i guess uh they said that on stage he could be a little ornery sometimes even with his own bandmates, and that he and Jack Bruce had some epic battles on stage when they were all playing together as part of Cream. Interesting. Anyway, also musically, I just went out and got my mail and my tickets for Dead & Co. New Year's shows were there, so I'm looking forward to flying out to Los Angeles. I'll see the Dead & Co. shows on the 27th and 28th of December. Then they go up to San Francisco to do New Year's shows. Oh, well, that would be a lot of fun. It's always nice to see those kind of shows. I haven't seen a dead New Year's show in years and years, but I always would say whenever I was at one, where else would you rather be on New Year's Eve? I remember a few years ago, our older son, Matt, was in New York for New Year's Fish. And one of his friends said, mm -hmm. oh, I don't know if I want to spend $150 to see fish. And he said, where else are you going to go for four or five hours and spend only $150 on New Year's Eve in New York City? And be completely entertained. It's a great deal. Yep. I agree. What's going on in the marijuana world? There's always a lot of stuff going on in the marijuana world. 32nd Update in Illinois, we're in full swing with the applications. There's now, it turns out, going to be a trailer bill that's going to be discussed when the Illinois legislature reconvenes on October 28th, sending a few shivers through the applicants in the industry because nobody's quite sure exactly what changes to expect. And this is right in the middle of the application process and they made a decision not to have agencies issue rules because they believe that the statute was drafted with enough specificity that it could substitute for the rules and that could keep the program moving forward unfortunately it looks like there's going to be quite a few questions including many around the social equity program and how it's laid out so it'll be interesting to see there's an opportunity on october 15th for the public to send in questions that they have about the statute and so we'll see how many questions get sent in and what kind of answers we get. But that's moving forward. It's very exciting times in Illinois. It's getting a lot of publicity. There's going to be a big conference next week 
in, in the Chicagoland area that's being sponsored by the Chicago Reader, who's one of the big alternative newspapers in town, and they're bringing in a number of different people to come talk about adult use and what it means. I'm going to actually be doing a presentation on uh, the legal ramifications of the new adult use bill. But, it, you know, we're, we're getting a lot of support from, now it's kind of funny to say the Chicago Reader is mainstream media, but in many respects it really is, given its circulation and how long it's been around. So we're very, very excited about that and can't wait to see what happens next. Oh, that'll be great for Illinois. We all look forward to 2020 in Illinois. Over in my world, we're very busy wrapping up the last of the tax returns for 2018. The extended due yep. date for individuals and corporations is next Tuesday. Yeah, on the cannabis accounting side, I have to whine a little bit. We're just so disappointed at the way the marijuana companies keep their books. It seems like bookkeepers are very challenged to provide an accurate set of books that we can do a tax return from. And that's what drives us crazy. And that's what keeps us going right till October 15th, trying to get these individuals and corporations done. And the books we get are just terrible. They're just terrible. There's very few people who have good internal bookkeepers. Go ahead. I, I can understand what you're saying, Jim. And I think that one of the things I tell anybody who comes into my office talk with me about representing them in their efforts to get a license. The very first question I ask them is, who is your accountant? When they don't have one for me, I say, well, I'm going to give you some names because you've got to get yourself an accountant. You have to have somebody with, with business and financial knowledge who's leading you from the beginning, because if you don't, you're, you're taking a crapshoot on 280E and anything else that can get in your way. Of course, um, in full disclosure, Larry and I have several mutual clients, and set, including a new one that we spoke to this week. People come in all bright-eyed and raring to go and think they have their capital lined up and they're going to have retail, they might have extraction, they're going to have cultivation. Many of these people have never had an employee before and they're going to have 50 employees. It's going to be very interesting to see how that's going to play out. Listen, like we always say, it's better to have a bill that we can complain about than not have a bill at all. Now, was that on a panel discussion yesterday at a CBD conference in Denver, which we'll talk about on another show, but on the business side, the panel discussion was I had there was a banker, another CPA, people who get financing, people who have a consulting business to try to get people bank accounts. The key word that was used throughout that panel discussion was transparency. If the bank is going to bank you, and it might be a cannabis-friendly bank, but they may or may not bank you a cannabis business, even if you are you know, at a cannabis-friendly bank, if you're not transparent. So what do we mean by transparent? You know, today is the middle of October here. Uh, you should be getting your books from your bookkeeper for the month of September. We still have people trying to cobble their books together for 2018, and 2019 is almost over. That's no way to run a marijuana company. Well, it's no way to run any company, right? And that's the problem right. is, is that you, know, you have to impress upon people that this industry is just a business. You have to run this the way you would run any other, a lot more carefully because of all the regulation and, and potential speed bumps like 280E. But right. people want to be involved in marijuana, and, and as you say, and as you, you know, I'm sure causes headaches for you, they don't have any business experience. That will kill you just as much as if you were trying to go open up a restaurant and you've never run a restaurant before. I want to take a quick break to thank you for listening to today's show. As the leading cannabis podcast network, we're constantly adding new cannabis podcasts to support our industry's growth. And that's why we're so excited to announce our newest podcast, The Cannabis Breakout, which premieres October 18th. The show is about the thousands of Americans who remain in prison for violating cannabis laws that have long since been overturned. The Cannabis Breakout gives cannabis political prisoners a voice. If you're a former cannabis prisoner, or have a loved one who is a cannabis prisoner, we want to share your story. Please go to mjbulls.com and sign up to be a guest. Yeah, what else do you have going in your cannabis world, Larry? I'll tell you something that, that's happened, Jim, that is really, really fascinating. Reasons that we'll talk about right here. Just a week or so ago, the 10th Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals ruled that the Fair Labor Standards Act, which is a federal statute, applies to workers in the cannabis industry, just like workers who are in traditional and federally legal industries. And the court basically went on to say 
that even though marijuana, uh, cannabis is a Schedule One controlled substance, notwithstanding that, the federal protections of the FLSA would apply. And it came up in a case with a guy who was a security guard for a cannabis company, filed a claim saying that the employer refused to pay him federally mandated overtime, and the company claimed that the FSLA did not apply to cannabis because cannabis was a Schedule One, so it wasn't entitled to federal protection. The appellate court ultimately disagreed, interestingly saying that it would give an unfair advantage to the cannabis industry if it didn't have to comply with the FLSA in the same way that other industries did. And what I thought was really fascinating by that was that it didn't say that it would put employees in the cannabis industry at an unfair disadvantage. It it focused on the industry owners and the way it would work that way, which Again, it's not something that I would have necessarily expected that they were they were applying a federal right in part to make sure that employers in that industry didn't get an unfair advantage over other employers. And then they also said there's longstanding precedent that the FL, FLSA does traditionally apply to activities that cover illegal matters such as gambling, things like that. They said, look, that the FLSA has been amended a number of times since the Controlled Substance Act was passed in the 1970s been amended to include a number of different labor practices, but working in the cannabis industry has never been one. So as a result, workers in the cannabis industry are now entitled to federally mandated minimum wage, overtime, and other labor protections. And what's really amazing is, you know, that could potentially lead to claims under Title VII for types of discrimination claims and things like that that are also employee protection, but they're part of federal law. So the idea has been these would necessarily apply to cannabis businesses. You wonder if companies with over 50 employees then would also have to provide health insurance. Great question, right? It, you know, the, 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 apparently the court said notwithstanding the illegality of marijuana, it's important to recognize, you know, rights of employees in an industry, even if it's federally illegal. Written by a judge who's been on the bench for a number of years in the Tenth Circuit, which covers, relatively speaking, conservative part of the country, which is also interesting in terms of the nature of the ruling. I can see where employers in the industry might be a little disappointed by it, but there's certainly an argument to be made that the type of industry that we all imagine the cannabis industry being is one where everybody is from top to bottom is treated with a certain amount of fairness. So I I think it's interesting. I haven't seen a major pushback from cannabis employers. Have you heard anything from any of your clients? No, there really hasn't been a lot of lawsuits on fair labor standards, but we have encouraged our clients that if you get over 50 employees, you probably should provide health insurance just like every other business in the country is required to do. The other piece of federal law that Casey just mentioned brings into the forefront is can owners of cannabis companies file for bankruptcy? Uh, We had a case in Colorado the better part of 10 years ago now where um, a cannabis company tried to seek bankruptcy protection under federal law. And the judge said, no, you are illegal at the federal level. You don't get the protection of the bankruptcy courts. Hopefully that will change. Because some of these people end up with large tax bills they can't pay. Uh, Any other U.S. citizen, if you are truly broke and can't pay your taxes, you can file bankruptcy three years after the tax return is filed. So taxes that are over three years old can be dismissed in bankruptcy. And so we'll see if that applies to the marijuana industry over the next few years. But as of now, I don't believe bankruptcy courts are available or at least they haven't been tested in recent years, to see if they're available for people in the cannabis industry. Well, you know, it, it, it's going to really be fascinating to see if you're willing to recognize certain rights or, conversely, obligations that are imposed by federal law that some might otherwise assume don't apply in an industry that's not recognized by the federal government as being legal or legitimate. And as we've discussed, I don't see any movement at the federal level until well after the 2020 election. I don't see that the federal government is in any mood to make any changes. Of course, we've discussed on past shows that Safe Banking Act is now over to the Senate. So we'll see if any bills get out of Congress and get signed other than housekeeping bills over the next year. I really think it's going to be a number of years. Listen to the political debates on the Democratic side. I listened to Trump's speeches that he had this week. The good news, in my opinion, is the word marijuana never comes up 
it is not a campaign issue for 2020 at all. And it's kind of like a no news is good news situation. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. I think, you know, as look, the states are coming online one after another, doing just fine without a lot of federal intervention. And topic for us to really get into on another day, Jim, is be careful what you wish for category. Right when things go legal and it solves issues like banking and 280E, which will be nice issues to get resolved, we're going to find ourselves with a host of other issues as all the various regulatory agencies in the United States all come walking in and exercising their, you know, their newfound regulatory jurisdiction, just like the FDA has done with CBD. It's going to be interesting to see when we come online, how we come online, and what impact that has. Yes. And the vape pen scare seems to be settling down. I haven't heard in the last week or so of any new deaths or cases reported. Doesn't seem to have hurt sales terribly among our client base. And I agree. I I have not seen or heard of any real slowdown in sales from the companies that I work with and people who I've spoken with. The consumers do seem to be getting a little more educated, though. Uh, And I have clients who have said that they've been approached by their customers wanting to know where the vape pens were manufactured, what testing has been going on to ensure that the oil isn't cut with anything like the vitamin E acetate that may or may not have been causing the problems before. And I think that's great that people pay attention to those kind of things and know enough to be able to ask those questions. It shows that we do have you know educated people who want to really make this industry as safe as it can be. And then for another show, the whole hemp CBD market is coming on strong and there you have another multi-billion dollar cannabis industry with THC below 0.3 percent and unlike smokable flour CBD is almost all manufactured products tinctures and creams and bath bombs well you know marijuana yeah. you can just grow it, grow it dry it out and sell it so the CBD industry has another level of sophistication with all the manufactured products. There's some vape pens, but there's a lot of other products out there on CBD. The difference of a CBD conference is you can sell your products there. You can cross state lines. You can bring your products down right. from Chicago and sell them in Denver. And uh, that's a, most of the uh, booths were selling their products uh, and giving samples. And I said, well, how much is your top shelf tincture here? $300 for a little tiny, maybe a two or three ounce bottle. Right. I said, $300. I said, are you able to get that price? Are you able to sell it at that price? And they said, it's our, our top shelf at $300 a bottle is our top seller. That's unbelievable. I guess we should switch it back to music. We have talked about some of our favorite Grateful Dead shows or fish shows over the years. This long before Larry and I knew each other, we were both at Silver Bowl shows outside of Las Vegas The UNLV football stadium is called the Silver Bowl. Every May for three or four years in the early 90s, the Grateful Dead would play shows in late May or early June, uh, which is a great time to be in Las Vegas because it's not unbearably hot yet, but you could have outdoor shows at night and be perfectly comfortable in a T-shirt. But those shows were, were a real hoot, really good shows. In fact, that's where I saw my last Grateful Dead show, was the Silver Bowl, May of 95, three months before Jerry Dudd. Well, I, I always enjoyed going to those shows, A, because they played great shows, B, because the surroundings were really pretty amazing. If there was a college football stadium, so it wasn't too huge. It wasn't like uh, you know being in an NFL-sized stadium. It had pretty good sight lines, but the, the, the surrounding landscape was absolutely incredible. And we were there one year with... A thunderstorm off in the distance with you know the lightning crashing down while they were playing and all sorts of great stuff and then of course nothing could beat the post show 35,000 deadheads descending on the strip and the funny part was it didn't seem that unusual you couldn't always tell who the deadheads were getting out of that show at midnight and then going out to the wee hours uh, gambling and carrying on in Las Vegas I remember one year I was at a little place right next to Circus Circus called Slots Slots of Fun. And it was shoulder to shoulder with deadheads, two, three o'clock in the morning. Somebody would win a hand, you know, the table would howl and the whole place would take it up and there'd be glass breaking and people howling and the dealers, they'd stop dealing. And we, pretty soon we'd stop <laughs> howling and, and they'd start dealing again. Over the years, we did see some good shows. I saw them. Out there, I saw two shows they played in 91 and then a three-show run that they did in 92. 
uh, the 92 shows were a lot of fun. We were out there for my good buddy Alex's uh, bachelor party. We were staying in the Golden Nugget in old downtown Las Vegas. And, you know, we'd come back every night for the midnight steak and egg breakfast, uh, which was always very appropriate at the end of the shows. That trivia, the, the, the second night there, I caught my first high times. It was my maybe 85th dead show. It was the first time I heard him play high times. All right. So it was one of those, you know, it, patience pays off finally. What was great about that weekend is that Steve, the Steve Miller band was the opening band for them. And the last night he came out with them, I want to say, you know, from the, the space all the way through the end, they did a great Addicts of My Life, but then they played a spoonful, which Bobby plays really well. And Jerry, Steve Miller was up there jamming away. A great other one closed with Morning Dew. And then I caught my first Baba O'Reilly Tomorrow Never Knows double encore. If you recall, Vince Welding it put pushed that one in and, and did a lot of the singing on the Baba O'Reilly and the Tomorrow Never Knows. That was a great double encore, talking about getting some classic rock tunes on the Grateful Dead set list. I had so much fun at, at those shows in Las Vegas. I remember I did get in a little bit of trouble when I got back to our campground. It, it was broad daylight, 6 o'clock in the morning, and uh, my wife was very concerned and upset that I had been gone all night. But luckily, I had been winning at the blackjack tables, and I pulled out a handful of dollars. Where have you been? I pulled out a handful of dollars. I've been gambling. I was winning. Crazy times in Las Vegas with the Grateful Dead. Those were great times. All right, everybody. Uh, so next week, we'll talk more about the uh, CBD industry and the CBD event that I was at um, and talk on a panel on safe banking. Just a quick lead into that. Some banks are now opening up to cannabis and CBD, but not marijuana. But yet there's still a deep background check that's done by their compliance department. It is still challenging even for CBD companies to get banking. So we'll dive into that next Deadhead Cannabis show. Until then, goodbye, everybody. Tim, thank you as always. Everybody have a great uh, week and a great weekend. And we'll look forward to speaking with you next time.